Hey, everybody. Welcome to the American Songwriter Podcast Network. This is All Heart with Paul Cardall. Forbes magazine calls him one of the most listened to recording artists of our time, with more than 3 billion streams and 11 number one albums on top Billboard charts. With his podcast, Paul wants to shed light on unique celebrities and influencers who use their gifts to make the world a better place, like you. His guests are all heart. For those that are listening, Richard Paul Evans really was my mentor in learning how to create a product that is of value, that means something, that changes lives, and then how to actually market that and and PR and get that out into the hands of people. So that is why this this interview is very special to me, and I'm excited to share Richard you with 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 my audience and with everybody with American Songwriter uh, because I think you have so much wisdom and insight into uh, just just being successful in terms of helping people and changing their lives. So thank you for being here. I hope so, you bet. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I, I smile because it's like, I remember I remember you sitting in my living room and I remember the, a woman, a neighbor said, you gotta meet this guy who plays the piano. And when I was little, I had a pretty um, difficult childhood, but one of the things I had a, um, that gave me, um, Give me solace was my brother played the piano and he was incredibly talented. He could, he never, he didn't take lessons. He could listen to a song on the radio and sit down and play it. So he was just gifted that way. And at night he would sit there and just play the piano and mm-hmm. just improvise and combine songs. And I, I remember just sitting there and feeling that peace. So when you came to my living room and started playing our piano, um, it, it was, it was that kind of experience. So it was a very personal thing. And at the time my book was so big. I mean, I was hearing from Garth Brooks people. Garth was thinking of doing a, 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 something based on my book. I was getting, I was getting calls from the White House. I mean, it was a, it was an insane time, and and uh, you were you were just a kid playing for tips <laughs> at ZCMI Center, and um, you know, I just, I there was a connection there. Well, the, that the entire Christmas box era and experience. I mean, that that really was my breakthrough. People say, well, you know, what was your breakthrough? I said, you know, it was. It was being at the right place at the right time, playing from the heart. And somebody heard it and, and gave you one of my CDs. Uh, and then uh, she, she, but I have to, let me back up. I was playing this song called Dave's Farewell. And I had written it for a friend that passed away. So the woman who uh, saw this was crying. She was by the makeup counter. And I thought, oh my gosh, her credit card's maxed out. She can't get what she wants. <laughs> but 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 Debbie Debbie Castleton comes walking towards me and and says that what is that song? And I, I she goes, it reminds me of my husband, and he had passed away four years earlier, uh, and um, he was the one that kind of created that whole, uh, well, the Castleton store that became the Nordstroms in Utah. Nordstroms came in and bought them out, but he, she came in and bought like every album I had up there on customer service and gave them to everybody. And she goes, I got to give it to this neighbor of mine who visits me all the time and takes good care of me. And that was you. And that's, that's in, in essence what happened. So it was, you know, people always say, you know, do you have to go and like play your music in front of a producer to get discovered? I, I say, you just got to pl- be at the right place at the right time and always play from the heart. So that was the beginning of our journey uh, with the Christmas box. Tell us, tell us, you know, I think the vast majority of people know what the Christmas box is, but for those who have been living on another planet, um, the Christmas box is the first novel that you wrote. Tell me and tell us the whole Kinko story and why you decided to do it uh, briefly so we can talk about some of this other amazing things you've got going on. Well, I was, at the time I was, I was 29 years old. I was working at, in an advertising agency working with political candidates. So I just, I had run for the state legislature myself as a young man and, and I was running a U.S. Senate race, and I had just lost my election by 100 votes. Best mm-hmm. thing that ever happened. Um, I had, all of a sudden, I had all this time on my hands. The election was over, and it, it was like, what am I going to do? And it really wasn't the time to start up 
anything is for Christmas. And I thought, I am going to write a book. And so that's what it started. I started, it, it, I didn't have any lofty ideas of being an author. I just, I wanted to write a book just to write a book. And that was the Christmas box. It was, I was thinking, what do I write about? And I, I'd heard somewhere that you write from what you're most passionate about. And at the time, what I'm most passionate about was my two little girls that I had become a father and it had changed everything. Mm. It's like, I adored these little girls. I'd come home and they'd get the window looking out waving, and they get so excited. You think it was Christmas morning, dad's home. You know, it's like best thing in the world. Right. They'd be so excited. And so um, I write this story and it just starts coming to me with incredible power. It's like, why am I getting such inspiration for this little book that doesn't matter? And I finish the book, give it to my wife, Carrie, and ask her to read it. And she's terrified because she just assumes this is a, I'm, she has to be, a, either I have to be a good writer, she has to be a good liar, and neither were right. likely. So, but she reads the book and, and from end to end, and she's just crying. And she goes, where did you get this book? And I said, it was just inspired to wake me up in the middle of the night. I pull up the freeway and start writing a chapter, you know, start writing and, so um, I printed up 27 copies at Kinko's and started to hand them out to neighbors. And that was it. You know, that's all mm. I was done. And apparently the book had other plans because all of a sudden I'm starting to get phone calls from people. And I remember one day, this was in um, a January, and this woman said, you know, this, I want to tell you what your book means to me. I said, how did you get my book? Who are you? She said, well, so-and-so gave it to me. I didn't know who that was either realize the book had been passed on from, um, from person to person. And, and um, so I started to track those copies down. And as near as I could tell, the book had been read more than 200 times. So for an average book to get read 10 times and passed on, there's something special there. So, and then I, I received a phone call from a bookstore and the, the clerk had gone down the Salt City white pages, calling all the R. Evans. And when they got to me, they said, did you write a Christmas <laughs> story? And I said, yes. And, he said, great, where do we order it? I said, you can't order it. There are no copies. It's not been published. She said, we've had 10 orders this week for it. Wow. So at that point, I thought I'd better publish it. So I sent it to publishers, and they all rejected it. No yeah. one was interested <laughs> in this book. Everyone who rejected it lost at least $20 million. I, I got the total got the last laugh. I've heard from a few of them. It's like, worst decision I ever made. Um, but I decided to self-publish it. And I knew nothing about the industry at the time, but I knew how to market uh, political candidates. And so I treated my book like a politician and uh, start going out there and pushing. In the first year, we sold um, um, 17,000 copies, which is in, most books don't ever reach that, but that was just locally. Yeah, let me stop you. Totally yeah, yeah, let me stop you right there because by treating it like a political cause, that's that's what I observed right when I came in. Because most people will just advertise, here's what it is, here's what it does. You, you, you basically created this movement to help mothers that were never able to bury their child. And, and as a father that, you know, uh, my, 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 we had two twins we were never able to, to bury, you created this experience that is so deep that's so profound i like when you say carrie ask you where did this come from rick <laughs> instead of you know that's amazing that you wrote this you're so amazing <laughs> he was like where did you get this rick get this, yeah. but i love that because what it teaches people is that when you have something that you're passionate about you need to share it in that way as as a cause a political cause not just uh something to to put some more money in your pocket it, it has purpose so yeah, that that's well, one of the first things i picked up the book, on. the book was magical and that's that's the important thing when you, when you find magic and we don't often in life but when the time comes and you do find magic you make the most of it yeah and so that's what that's what i did and so it just kept growing people kept asking for it and so i self-published it in 1994 and you know, just fools rush in, right? I, I went out and printed up 400,000 copies. I had no idea. I mean, I was taking every dime I had and putting it back into print. And I got one of my candidates uh, to fund, to actually guarantee the printing. 
and um, printed up 400,000 copies, not knowing that, not realizing that there's, you know, that chances of that happening are like being struck by lightning. But 400,000, sorry four, to interrupt you, but 400,000 copies, that's insane. That's, yeah, that's insane. Like, I mean, <laughs> maybe, it, yeah, out, of, out, of, out of 2 million books written every year, there's probably uh, six of them that do that. Yeah, that's why I'm sitting here going, oh, yeah, I just printed up 400,000 copies. You knew there was a demand, but it's like, I'm going to go, you mortgaged your home. No, not for, not for the book, but we use every dime we had. Oh, wow. Wow. Every dime. So, um, so what I did, because the campaign we had just done, that just won, it, it, we were able to get, you know, do okay financially with it. And so, but I did, I did the math. I mean, I remember seeing this really fancy restaurant in New York and Jack Romano, at the time was the head of um, Simon Schuster Global. He works with Paramount. He was huge, right? And you've been in meetings like that. And he turns to me and he goes, how did you do that? And how did you know the book was going to sell? Hmm. And I said, well, it was a matter of math. I saw what, with what, um, how many, if I put this many books in the area, how many would sell, how many were, were, it went viral. And this is before social media. If social media was out today, we probably would have sold 50 million copies, right? Because this was all, this was all one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, your money ball on this. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, yeah. I just did the math on it. And, um, I said, frankly, I was disappointed because the sales were half of what I thought. He just shook his head. He goes, you paid off a $4 million advance in two months. He goes, no one's ever done that before. We had, it, the Christmas box, for those who don't know, at the, during the phenomenon, it had the highest one-week sell of any book in history until Harry Potter. Hmm. Uh, Harry Potter actually got up, to, got up to that level. But up to that point, it was like 10 times what John Grisham did. That's yeah, and, and you were self-published in the B. I I mean, you were self-published. Uh, self-published. And these other people had the backing of all these, you know, mega PR people and, and the marketing and the distribution. I, I recall that you, you know, you, you dug in deep with some of the local distributors in Utah, which had, had almost all access, but like you were really strategic in how to get that into the stores because you don't it was, just get it was it. tough. It was yeah. tough. Uh, in fact, one time I was frustrated because what actually, when the book actually hit really big and there was no Amazon.com, that would have changed everything. There was no Amazon. Mm. So I couldn't just put it up there and everyone could run to it. Right. So all of a sudden we're getting all this um, press and it wasn't in the city. So one time I was frustrated because I was hearing from people, I couldn't find your book. And so what I did, I had this little distributor who made millions off of it. Um, and I, I, I said, okay, if you can't find my book, here's their phone number. Okay, I did it during a small city radio interview. I get a call three in the afternoon from the distributor. He goes, you didn't accidentally give our number out, did you? <laughs> and I go, uh, yeah, I, I did actually. And he said, you shut us down. He said, every line has been full for the last six hours trying to get the book. He goes, we can't ship books when you do that. Mm. It's like, you're hurting yourself. Mm. It's like, that's how it, it was. It was tough. So when the book, I'm sitting with Harry, um, Harry Evans, who just passed away, mm -hmm. who was a titan in the publishing industry, mm -hmm. British. He, he was Sir Har Harold Evans. Everyone knew, knew who he was. Um, he was literally knighted by the queen, right? And um, he said, you know, we did research on your book and he's trying to get the book from me. And, um, he wants to publish it. And he said, you were only in, in 5% of the bookstores in America when you hit number two on the New York times. That's no one blown. does that. He goes, no. this is, this is going to break records. That's amazing. He goes, how much do you want? <laughs> goes, and my agent said, no, we're, um, we're going into an auction. He said, and I guess we'll be playing table tennis, won't we? <laughs> I'll never forget that. And he, he also says something really profound. He said, look around this room and in this big office, there were manuscripts stacked about three feet high across all the walls. Mm. And uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting to look at. He said, that's just what the agents bring me. Wow. We know there's gold in the hills, but sometimes you'd have to move a mountain to find them. And so for those, I mean, for those that are listening to this podcast because they're artists, there's a time that you have to realize it does come down to the art. 
Mm -hmm. that there's something that's so magical that when people hear it, they connect to it immediately and say, wait, there's something here. It does come down to the art. I haven't been able to replicate uh, what happened with the Christmas box. It was the right time, the right place, um, the right need. And as USA Today said, it's like, it's the number one book in America. And it's like, it's answering this need for family in a distracted time. Yeah. Yeah. The book it knocked off at number one of all things was Howard Stern Private Parts. Did you see a greater dichotomy? This book that was really obscene, actually, and then this beautiful, this beautiful family. Yeah. Story, you know, God, you know, they were head to head. So when it when it knocked him off, I'm sure he threw a tantrum. Uh, I get a call from USA Today, and they said, "Well, thank God." <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> They said, thank God, that's something of decency, actually. Well, you never, you, and you never got an invitation from Howard Stern to be on the show? Oh, jeez. I got Danny Bonaducci. Oh, yeah, that's walked, right. You did do Danny. I walked into that not knowing what that was, and it... You softened him up, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the end. He, he basically told me he beat up Donny Osmond, broke his nose, <laughs> asked his big woman with him if she thought I was cute and wanted to go back to my hotel, just like... Oh, man. Oh, man. And then the last thing I said is, look, Danny... I mean, I know you're flippant and he said, yeah. but this book is healing for people who have lost children. Yeah. And that just stopped him cold. And then he, then he goes into probably the only time in his career that he actually got soft on air. He got teary eyed and he said, yeah. no, I, he goes, I'm a screw up. He said this on air. I mean, there's tens of thousands of people listening. He goes, I'm a screw up. I mean, the stories about me and he goes, it's somewhere there was one thing good, and he goes, my little girl, my daughter, and mm. I'm going at night, I don't know why God would give me something like this, mm. who I am. There's something ever happened to her. He goes, God bless you, man. Everyone would go out in Chicago, go out and buy his book. <laughs> I mean, it was just yeah. like, it was, and, and I could see the people it, up in the like little glass watching him, the producers yeah. going, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is a new night. And uh, it was so powerful. Let me ask you, uh, to the, what your point, what you're saying, but it, away from the Christmas box, there seems to be this thing that exists in the media or in commercial, the commercial market that when you start to talk about family values and you start to talk about God in books, they get scared and they run uh, or it's taboo or, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Like he's got this platform where he's got to be, you know, crude and, a jokester and you know the the rebel from the partridge family but 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 then you have all these people that are creating these amazing products that are for good and it it seems like whenever we take something that's special like the relationship of children or somebody that has had cancer or some you know things that are really relevant to life why is it that they sh the publishing world, the music world are afraid of a lot of that stuff. Well, the biggest reason, I, I mean, I've discovered that like the publishing world, is it's not that like they're immoral, some are, but it's not that they're immoral, it's that they're amoral. They follow the buck. Okay. And um, one thing, and I'll cautious, caution anyone in this industry, if you set yourself up, as, hey, I'm Mr. Moral Guy, and I'm doing this, so you should buy my book. That's immoral. I mean, you, if you're doing it, it's like, buy, don't buy a book because it's going to give good value. Because it's like, no, people buy things because they're art. Mm. I never set out to write a book that was like moral or ethical. Virtuous, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote a book that was about my ex life experience. Okay. I mean the love that I had for my little girls is just like, it was, it's like, I adore them. You know, I just adore them. And it's like, I didn't want to be a father. So this, I was very passionate because I was, like, I was like a convert. I told my wife, I didn't want to have children. She's like, what do you mean you don't want children? You came from a family of 10. I go, exactly. Yeah, right. Why would you want to do that again? It was abusive. It was tough. And it's like, um, and so when these little girls came, I mean, they're just everything. And now they're, they're out, I'm so proud of them. They're women. They have, I have grandchildren. I'm so proud of them, who they are. And when I wrote this, it was just very real. And what happened is those feelings, it's, it's about authenticity. It's about vulnerability. That book was completely honest. 
Yeah. And so when a businessman, and this all happened, when a businessman in Japan or a father in Iraq, the book was smuggled into Iraq or um, Iran. And it's like, they read this and all of a sudden they think, I need to work less. I need to spend more time with my children. Right. All of a sudden they had that. All of a sudden that was real. And so, you know, don't write things to be virtuous. Write things because you love virtue. Okay, that's that's the reality. The Christmas box for the things I write about, they're real. And there's and that that means like there's darkness in everything, there's darkness in us. We're all broken people. Right. But that's the beauty of it. We can be broken and stupid and but we can still see good when we see it. And so to like try to put a um a, a cloak over that yeah. is 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 you know, is a horrible thing to do and, and it is bad for culture on the other hand to try to claim that you're the virtuous one look at me virtue sick. I hate virtue <laughs> look how good i am look what i did and you know it's like just be just be authentic and be real and you know i just I, you know those early days i still hear from people and you'll see them post online and said you know I, i'm at a vent and richard stopped i was in pain and stopped and said, can I help you? And he stopped assigning to do something for me. And it's like, that wasn't trying to get attention. That was like, that could have been my sister or my friend. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's, it's being real. Well, that's something I also picked up from you, you know, because, you know, one of the things you had me do was you had this big long line of people out the door for hours to get a uh, timepiece, which was your second novel. Uh, and I had come in working on the Christmas box album and we put a piano there because you felt bad that people had to wait in the line. You wanted them to get up to you and have that one-on-one -on -one experience. And I'd sit and I'd play for everybody and it was nice, but I, I observed the line would not move as fast. And I was like, what is going on? And I look over, you are like hugging <laughs> almost every person that comes in and like you know these people and they know you and I'm like he's giving them a, a, a what I call a woman at the well experience you're making them right there in that moment feel like the most amazing person and I watched that and I said I'm always after every concert uh if as a, if I'm allowed to go out I don't care if I'm immunosuppressed. I'm going to shake everyone's hand and really get to know them. And I picked that up from you. And it's the most rewarding thing in the world because I could have these meet and greets that are like, you know, hundred dollars a person here. I just, I said no, because I want that one-on-one -on -one like you've had and you keep having with your, your customers. So that's another thing I, I picked up on. Well, I, I'm really, you know, I'm just really grateful for them. In fact, I had this experience, um, and I think it sums up how I feel about the relationship. Um, when my daughter Allison was a teenager, and she's, by the way, she is um, a nurse, again, her doctor right now, and she's amazing. Uh, she is an amazing person. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. all your kids great. are amazing. But she was a teenager. Yeah. And one day she comes home and she goes, she goes, oh, dad, I met one of your fans today. And he goes, <laughs> such a weirdo. You know, my family's a weirdo. Oh, she's a weirdo. She found out who I was. She's like, oh, he's in. <laughs> he was making fun of her. And I said, I go, what does she look like? She goes, well, what do you mean? I go, what, what color hair does she have? She goes, um, brown. Go, what color were her eyes? It's like, well, I don't know, maybe brown. I go, what size, how tall was she? She's like, yeah, why? I go, well, how tall? She goes, I don't know, maybe like mom's size. And I go, how old? I don't know, old like you, you know? It's like, and she goes, why? And I go, I know who that woman is. Wow. She goes, you do? And I said, she's the woman who bought the closure work. And she just stopped. I said, she's the woman who um, yeah. made our heating bill this month. Mm. And Allison just looked at me and I said, you know, she's the one who um, paid for our last vacation. That's amazing. She goes, she goes I, I get it. I go, Allison, don't ever make fun of one of my readers again. Yeah. Said, you read when one of my readers tells them tells yeah. you who they are, you say thank you. Yeah. Wow. Say, you. You've given us a great life. You have allowed my dad to to produce art for a living. You've um you've paid for our schooling and I just really am grateful for you. That's so beautiful. He goes, okay. And yes. you know, and Ali is really grateful, but I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Um 
You know, I, I, I made a rule years ago. It's like, I will never, have, if someone comes to a signing, and sometimes people run up and think, where do you know how it is? People, the weird things happen when you're working with crowds. But um, I actually chased someone out from a signing after the parking lot because I didn't have eye contact with them. They kind of got their book after waiting an hour, they got their book and left and they didn't have an experience. Mm -hmm. I go, I just told my staff, stop. That woman did not even get to see me. I didn't say hi to her. That is not okay. I go, I'll be right back. And the line just stopped and I ran out and I said, thank you. That's the hardest, that is the hardest. I, I, that is a painful feeling when you're watching your fans come to you and you're gonna sign something and then they, it's like you watch them get, and then they leave. And yeah, you gotta go after that person because they need to know that you care about them and that you love them and that they are doing all that stuff. That's, yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, you know, there's a great karma to it. One time I was at a bookstore in, in um, Alabama and, and I'm walking to the store and I see a little boy holding my Michael Vay book walking out and with his mother, I go, I looked at him, I stopped, I had the entourage with me, I stopped and I, I go, you're going the wrong way. And she looked up and she goes, oh, you're Mr. Evans. And the little boy said, she goes, they kicked us out of the store. I go, they kicked you out? He goes, yeah, they said we can't come in because we bought the book somewhere else. I said, mm -hmm. did they? I said, well, guess what? We're going to have a private signing. I go, what's your name? And like, Jack, I go, okay, Jack, we're going to have a private signing right here with you. Okay. And you know what, you know, you see the tears in the mother's eye. I mean, it's just like, I, I have a dad, I get it. Yeah. And then what happens Then they she posts it online and it goes viral. And it's like, well, I didn't do it for that. I did it for Jack. And that's movie. right. I actually really did it for the mother because as a parent, nothing hurts us more than seeing our children disappointed. And um, so it's that, you know, after 25 years of doing that, it's like you have people who will, who will take a bullet for you. Yeah. And which makes me even more grateful and love them more. So I see it as a, as a, as a real family, as a, as a community of yeah. my readers. And uh, I can't, you know, I'll, I'll never be able to repay them for what they've done for me. You are coming up, I think, on a, a 25 years as an author. Or are you a little past 25? I, I want to add, do you know how many books you have? There are yeah. so many books. What's the, my, how many do you have? Yeah, my new book, The Noel Letters, it's my 41st novel. 41st. First. And that's part of your Noel series. Yeah, it's not really, and that, my publisher hates that I did that. It's a collection because the books have nothing to do with each other. So people come on, it's like, do I have to read the other three <laughs> books? They, go, they have nothing to do with each other. I just, I, I'm just grabbing the name Noel. Before that was Mistletoe. Uh, they said, please don't do that again. <laughs> so they know, but, but what's, what's this one about? Because I mean, you've had so many, one of my favorite books uh, that uh, I think tends to get looked over is the looking glass, obviously, because I scored music. We did an album for it, but that was one of my favorite, favorite stories. Cause I'm a man from Snowy river guy. I'm a somewhere in time person. And you, you, you created this like, 19th century that was fun yeah that was a, such a great great story an irish heroine named uh quay yeah well, that's it, the one and i wanted that as a still, film it's still yeah it's still sold a million copies i mean it was still really big oh well i'm sorry <laughs> really oh geez you know but, but th that's the one i was like man that would be an amazing movie well it, which is interesting because um right now I'm in this new realm, which is really interesting. I had like the Christmas box was produced mm -hmm. by CBS. It was the number one movie of the year where I had 20, 30 million viewers. It was 40, 40 million. 40 million. Okay. Um, well, and then they did timepiece with James Earl Jones. Mm -hmm. I had amazing Na a new Naomi Watts, who now is like a megastar. She was new at the time. And um, then the locket and, and uh, then didn't have anything produced for a while. And then uh, Perfect Day was made with Rob Lowe and Christopher Lloyd, which was totally cool. And then nothing. And went just a nothing for years. I thought I'll probably never have anything produced again. And then all of a sudden, this producer shows up. And he read his wife had read a story about me in USA Today. And she said, you need to meet this guy. Well, he flies to Utah with his um, wife and says, I produced about 75 movies. And I would like, I've read your books. I love them. I'd like to start producing them. Well, he does, and we, they start getting made. And so 
I'm now up to eight movies, um, but right now almost everything's being made. So right now in the Noel series, um, Noel Diary is being produced as a feature film, my first feature with Netflix starring Justin Hartley. Wow. Um, and congrats. Uh, director Charles Shire, who's big. If you look. Yeah, this, yeah, congratulations. Wow, man. This major movie. So it's a feature film. Then no, uh, Noel Strangers are being pitched to um, Hallmark right now. Uh, Noel Letters, or Noel Diary, or Noel, excuse me, Noel Street. There's four Noel books. Uh, <laughs> Noel Street, I get a call um, from this producer. He goes, hey, I, there's a lot of buzz about you in Hollywood right now. And um, this guy, he said the name. He goes, have you ever heard of the movie Pretty Woman? You go, well, everyone's heard of Pretty Woman. Uh -huh. Julian Roberts, he goes, he fell in love with your Noel Street book. And he wanted permission to write the screenplay for it and sell it. Heck yes, yeah. So that's happening. And then Noel Letters, I've already heard from a producer. So, so and then I have two producers who have come about um, wanting to work out a deal and do a TV series. So, so much is happening right now. It's just, it's crazy. I don't know why, why now. Um, Noel Letters, it's, it's a standalone book. It's the one that just came out. Um, it's my wife's favorite of my 41 books. We've heard a lot of good things about that. There's been so many anxious comments of people that want to read that. So yeah, I mean, I'm, ex I'm excited. I'm excited to read that one. So many of our, uh, so many of our listeners are trying to do music, are trying to write books. You've been very successful at surrounding yourself with a team of people what do you look for when you're trying to gather your team to help uh, uh, propel these things? And, and then how, how do you, how do you maintain motivating them? Well, it's like my assistant, Diane's been with me for 12 years. My first assistant, um, Celeste, who I wrote my book, uh, Finding Noel about, uh, she is now taken over at the Christmas Fox house as an executive director. And yeah. I just thought, I was talking to her this morning about some really cool things that are happening. And I thought she has, I go, you are so smart. You have really grown. And she said, well, you taught me when I was, I was, I was young. I was 21 when you brought me in. And so what I look for is I look for someone, first of all, they have to care. They have to be passionate. If they're not passionate, then there's no point. If they don't believe in what you're doing. And then you don't want to be there because it, you have to believe more than the success because you have to keep giving and giving and giving and you're going to be yeah. exhausted sometimes. And so my assistant literally said to me last week, she goes, you know, I don't really need to sleep. <laughs> what? I go, yes, you do. And she goes, no, I just want to do this. And as long as I have a couple hours a day to exercise, it's like, oh my goodness. I, I'm so blessed with hard work. Uh, and that's the other part, the other thing, passion and work ethic. And yeah. so my assistant was a country girl. You know, I was doing construction work as a kid. I, I was doing construction work since I was nine. And so um, one time, uh, Carolyn Reedy, the president of Simon Schuster, said in the cover of the Wall Street Journal that Richard Paul Evans is our hardest working author. And that actually, to me, was a compliment. <laughs> Not our best writer. She said, our hardest worker. I go, to me, that was more of a choice. You know, writing is a, was a gift from God. That was something I just came to me. And, yeah. but um, the, working hard is a choice every day. You know, it's like, what, how, what more can I do to share my art? You've been fortunate because I know the people that you, you know, that you've surrounded yourself with and they're all very intelligent, strong women. And I love the fact that you hire women because uh, they get the job done. Celeste, you know, uh, now she's the executive of the Christmas Box House. And I want to talk about the Christmas Box House because this is a shelter early on that Richard and everybody with the Christmas Box Foundation, which is a, a foundation you set up so that you can help children who have been abused uh, and uh, slow the process uh, so that it's less frightening for the child who has to be removed from a domestic violence situation. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, That's absolutely right. Great. It's 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 remarkable. I've been down there. I've played the piano during the holidays down there. And uh, where did that idea come from? And 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 in essence, how's it going now? Because that's amazing. I, I, I smile because I'm having so much fun with this <laughs> right now. Um, I feel like I just took the Ferrari out of the garage and cleaned it up, and it's running great. Um, <laughs> 
Well, because it's, it's seriously, it was kind of, it, it, we've helped more than 125,000 abused children. And um, that's a lot of kids. That's like stadiums and stadiums yeah. of kids. And um, when we started, it took, it just about killed me. Uh, the first four years of the Christmas box house was no fun at all. Okay, it just about bankrupted me and we had very spiritual experiences that kept it going, but it was constantly just on the ground. I was funding everything and things were, you know, we're talking about millions of dollars. And so it just about bankrupted me. Uh -huh. And um, it, was, it was one of those experiences that it's like, why did I do this? And, uh, and it's like, no, you did it for the right reasons, just hold the course. In fact, at one time, the, um, the board, I walked into a board meeting and they said, um, my dad, who was on the board, said, We'd like to, I'd like to make a motion before we start. I said, yes. And he said, I'd like to make a motion we shut everything down. And I'm like, what? He goes, this was what you came in for. It's bankrupting you. And uh, I said, we just shut everything down. And, I, did, and it's like, do we have a second? I go, wait, wait, wait. Are you all in on this? And they're most over there. I go, just, I go, just a minute. And I go into, um, I'm in my office, I go out of the boardroom, I go into um, a utility closet and I kneel down next to a water heater. And frankly, I wanted to shut it down. Okay. Everything my dad said was true. There was no, our, we had this motto, no good deed goes unpunished. And I knelt down, I said, can I be done? Can we, it didn't work, can I be done? And a very strong impression came to me, like a voice that said, if you fell, no one will succeed. Mm. I took a deep breath, like, okay, all right. And I walked back to the board meeting. And I said, um, I'm not shutting it down. If you'd like to resign, you can resign. And then the, um, the head of primary children's residential, so the number one guy in the state said, you don't know what you don't know, Rick. You've already failed. The ship is going down. Mm. And thought a moment, I said, Okay, then I guess I go down with it. Wow. I said, you're all free to leave. Um, anyone who wants to stay. And they sat there and my dad said, okay, I take the motion off. I, and it's like, let's get to work. And it was a nightmare. You know, it didn't, it, everything did just fix, but it's like, but we got, we didn't get what we wanted, but we got what we needed. Mm -hmm. And it started to gain momentum and it took about four years before all of a sudden the, 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 um, the government forces started to work with us and, and the um, people started to notice it. We started to get donations that were more than five dollars, and um, yeah. it started to come. And and then once we got, and inspiration came the whole way. And so I mean, now um, I run into kids. I'm at a book signing. This woman said, "Leans for she has three little kids with her, and she's just you know a suburban mother and sweet as can be." She goes, "I was one of your Christmas box house kids." Oh, really? She goes, yeah, my parents were drug addicts and abusive. Wow. And I was taken out. She goes, I lived in your house and thank goodness it, I was able to get my life on track and now I'm a mom. And what a beautiful reward. You know, and I see that more and more as I have adults coming to me and it's like, what a beautiful thing to see and be a part of. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I love the Christmas box house. And if you go, if you guys want to know more about it, just go to the christmasbox.org because now um, after all these years, I was so burned out after five years, it, it about bankrupted me. It took all my money. It, um, it was miserable and it kind of broke me, you know, I kind of had PTSD and, and I just said, I, I need to focus on my book. You run it. And, and what, and what happened eventually over time, they just kind of got, um, I don't know, kind of lazy, right. They just kind of expected things. We had created such momentum by that point. Um, and we just recently stepped back in. It's like, we can do more. And so, and I'm having a ball. And so we let the executive director go and brought Celeste in and she's totally on fire. Yeah, that was a smart move. Yeah. Smart well, move. Well, she, the thing is she, she was a foster kid herself. She was sexually yeah. abused as a child and she's open about these things. And, mm -hmm. and, and then what, when she, she helped me found it, she saw how it used to be, how gratitude was the basis of everything we did. And then when, when she left, she went into the corporate world with major, you know, multi-million dollar corporations running huge buds. At, and she became a very powerful marketer and she was voted uh, Utah marketing woman of the year. Mm. It's like, I'm so proud of her. Yeah. She, she called me <laughs> to come to my award and, 
And now she's back taking everything she knew. And it's almost like she went away to school and now she gets back to the family business. That's right. And so we are being flooded with donations right now. Um, there's a lot of buzz on trafficking. Well, may, people who are major in trafficking are coming to me to ask me to bring things together for them, including celebrities are coming and saying, because yeah. we have a track record, because we've, um, because we are very careful. You know, we, people our people work for Don't Get Rich. They go here because they're passionate and they want to help yeah. kids. That's incredible. It's such a remarkable journey you're having because you don't just see things as, well, I need to, I need to go to work and I need to pay the bills. It's this, you're, you're changing lives. You're changing the world. One of the last questions I like to ask my guests is, uh, as we close up here is, uh, when, you know, 200 years from now, we're all gone. What is, what is, what is, what do you want people to remember about Richard Paul Evans? What is your legacy? What would you hope to leave behind? Um, I guess the, I guess the reality is in some ways I don't really care because by that point I'll move on to the next adventure. Wow. And whatever God has in store. Uh, there are things, I, I think one thing that might be weird is the angel statue became real. You know, the angel statue in the Christmas box is real. There's now 150 monuments around the world. And people are going to find this. They're going to find these angel statues. And it's like, what is this? They're all around the world. Someday they're going to say, Who, where did this come from? So, I mean, I think about that as a curiosity. But the truth is. It's um, brilliant. My, I haven't, I'm not stacking everything up on this life. The best stuff is yet to come, I believe that. I believe um, the next place we go, there's going to be even more, even better music and better writing. And uh, it would be cool to sit down someday with Shakespeare and have a talk about <laughs> writing the Christmas story. You know, I, um, you know, I know there's a next world. I, yeah. I've had that experience. And so it's like, it's, it's, um, it's exciting, and I, the legacy I hope that leaves when I die, just right after I die, was he made the world a better place. That's that's all I hope. Yeah. Okay, that we miss him. Yeah. So as as Dickens said, that even the Undertaker mourns. Um, I've recently seen some people who have passed away, and people were glad. People celebrated their death, and mm -hmm. it's like um, the best uh, endorsement I have about me, Paul, and as you know, it's my 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 kids like me. You know, they like me. Um, I flew to Texas the other day because my daughter was homesick. She needed her daddy. It's like, my kids like me. My wife likes me. And that's the hardest thing to do. Because that takes, that takes full time. That's, it also <laughs> takes completely removing the ego, which is what drives so many people who are so disassociated. And... I, I'm, I'm thinking about this, this, the, those statues, because those statues that are everywhere, you know, and I, I've gone and been there thinking about my, my twins that I lost. And I remember, you know, way back when, before I'd even heard about you, I started, this was 90, 93, 94. I started having these dreams about angels. And that's when I would go to the piano and try to mimic the angels. And that ended up being Jenna's dance on the Christmas box. Jenna's the name of your daughter. Um, she's also Jenna Welch. She's also a writer. Check out some of her work. Major really, writer. really good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's a major writer. She's with Simon Schuster. So, but Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, people can find you at richardpaulevans.com and your books are pretty much everywhere. Is there anything <clears throat> else yeah, specific guess, we want to share with people? Besides? Yeah, we didn't really, and we didn't say that much about it, but Noel letters, it's a story about forgiveness. And if I were to put a Bible verse, I'd say John 8, the truth will set us free. It's about a girl coming back to see, a young woman coming back to see her father because he's dying. He dies before she gets there. But they're estranged. She hasn't talked to him in 10 years. And she starts to unravel what actually happened and finding the truth. And um, I think a little inspired me. You know, what really, what, what is the truth? So uh, I think you'll, I hope you enjoy it.
I really love that. Thanks for being here. My pleasure.